Okay, so welcome to uh, the last NOAA log of 2021. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. And just to remind everyone on the call here that if you do not wish to be recorded, just stay muted and turn off your video and you will not be recorded at all. Uh, we will be recording the whole presentation and we will typically, if the recording is of a good enough quality, it will be posted to YouTube. So just a warning, this is a, a recording meeting. So with that said, we have John Alexander today, who's gonna be doing a little bit of a revamp on an older talk, uh, making hardware work with Linux. And so this may be a different angle than you're used to when we talk about how to work with Linux. So with that said, uh, John, the floor is yours, go ahead. Ah, thank you there, Peter. Yes, yeah, so um, this was originally done, uh, so February time, um, for the Wolves look here in the UK. So uh, uh, really, I haven't had much time to look at this one since, actually. So it's going to be as new to me almost as to yourselves. And uh, <clears throat> basically, the, the situation is that um, most people want their hardware to work under Linux if they've got obviously going to run Linux. So it is an issue for everybody. The um, I think pretty much now it is a it's generally a given most things will work right and um, but what do you do how do you find out how do you communicate to the uh, various communities uh, providing driver support for Linux and how do you diagnose maybe some basic problems yourself um, hopefully without um, recourse to uh, go into these communities so you can um, get the thing going yourself. And uh, generally speaking, the uh, the important things are very simple. So uh, we'll start. All right. And uh, we say here we've got uh, sort of very quickly, there were six uh, different uh, partitions there. So, uh, you yeah, know, consider the marketplace. What do you need? What is available? All right. And uh, we're going to go down. Are we there yet? So I think those are the, probably the two most. That, that gives us 80% of the way there. We're fine. So, uh, you know, so consider the marketplace. Where? Do, what do you need? What do you actually want? Do you really want that uh, latest and greatest scanner or the 10-year-old scanner? Is there something better available? All right. So um, I always look personally when I'm looking for some hardware, I will even now, even if I'm pretty certain that it will work and it's a generic device, right? But it has um, either ch support for the specific uh, device and uh, if not the specific device, the chipset or the generic device, anything. So a camera probably will work because of the generic driver, right? And uh, obviously that's far from uh, guaranteed, but uh, generally speaking, you can plug and go, but um, that's where we're going, All right? And uh, this is say here, has someone done this before and is it documented? I will find, if if it's slightly off the beaten track, I'll be looking for the documentation and I'll make some kind of judgment to whether I feel comfortable in uh, following that documentation or uh, someone else's and if someone else, several people have done the same thing and it's a matter of plugging it in, then I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be doing that and uh, you know, people do on your conversely, do I want to be different? And uh, we can see this chap here. Uh, I think I think he's, he's, uh, his nom de plomb was Charles Bronson and uh, he spent a lot of time in prince, prison looking quite mad like that. And that's probably what we'll, you either are or you will be if you just start plowing a, uh, a new furrow independent of what people have already done All right so uh <clears throat> this is what we're, what we're saying we're talking about check to basically checking the, the actual uh articles the web right to the, uh, the magazines the uh, the the, the actual uh, sources of information it doesn't really matter which one they are find out what you can't uh, what you can support and what you can't support All right so um 
you know, we were we also, you know, don't look for the cheapest thing. If you're looking for the cheapest, right, then quite often the support can be quite flaky, right? So, and if you get good support under Linux, you will then also get good support under, uh, generally speaking, under Windows as well. So, uh, if they spent that time to finish the uh, product, then uh, you're in a good place, right? And here we go. So, here we go with the money, right? If the money's there, right, people have actually put something in there and actually dealt with it. You know, if it's a good quality product, you're going to be there most of the time. And um, here we go. And so uh, what do you need? I mean, it's, it's very difficult, really, because, I mean, you, 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 if you're going to buy, basically, you're going to buy decent enough hardware, good price, good, well-reviewed, and you're, um, you're, you're going to basically uh, put that in there. And you're basically going to walk away at this point and uh, you're going to be very, very happy. And you're going to say this Linux hardware business is totally uh, for the birds. Just plug it in and uh, there's no uh, great um, subject to be learnt. And uh, hopefully that's where we're going to be 80% or plus of the time. All right. And um, however, so if we, uh, if we go, there we go. We'll probably go for somewhere. Are we there yet? And um, We'll miss out a few sections there because I've probably we've gone over those already. So, uh, you know, 80% of the time we're going to be there. We've chosen the right product, and you are, as per Tux, there clapping your hands, and it's fantastic. Early signs of success. And really, you should plan to uh, get there uh, straight from the get go. So, uh, trying to actually buy hardware which is on the fringe is actually a bad idea right and it will cause you a lot of pain and um, <clears throat> that's not only for uh, linux that's probably for windows especially as we've gone from sort of windows 7 to 10 and now we're going towards the windows 11 that is too going to uh, cause a lot of problems so uh, good purchases will pay back dividends all right and uh, let's go back here all right, and uh, as an example, we've just got um, a system here. This is just um, listing all the modules, all right? And this is probably the actual fact it probably is missing, gone out of, sick, out of order, but um, probably your first non trivial um, view uh, upon trying to diagnose what is happening is to see if you actually have a driver um, for already installed for your uh, device and uh, if you can't recognize it then um, you may need to uh, maybe remove that device and start again and let's go see what we can find for you here and uh, we're in the this example here is for an rtl device which is a uh, actual dongle for uh, receiving television, also used as a uh, radio and STR device. All right, so I've got one of these plugged in there now. All right, and this has uh, been recorded some time before, but um, you can see that uh, the driver support is there. If we go back, see if we can go back. Yes, we can. Um, here we go. So uh, third from the bottom is dev usb and the rtl dongle so i do actually know it's there all right and uh here i've actually gone into the device directory and uh looked at the uh dvb which is digital video devices and uh, we can see a full set of uh endpoints which uh is all very handy so i know that's going to work all right and uh <clears throat> We're not in this situation for that particular device, but uh, not working. So what are we going to do now? Which is possibly, hopefully, the much less than 20% of any hardware you're ever going to buy. But uh, if you are there, that probably takes 90% of your uh, time to work out how it's going to go. All right, and this is the uh, device I'm talking about. It's one we use for um, some of the RTTY decoding, etc. But um, we had uh, on the uh, 
a previous talk. All right, so um, <clears throat> D message. So if I've just plugged into this, this hardware into the uh, into the device, you will actually see a uh, message being written out to D message, and D message is uh, the kernel's effectively um, log. It's called a log for sake of argument, but um, it's just a continuously running buffer uh, messages from the kernel turn up there, and you can view those. All right, and as you say here, you can see where the device was found, where it was even initialized, or um, what you are getting intermittent problems. So maybe you've got a very long wire and uh, connecting it, and uh, as I've got some here about 20 meters long, and the device sometimes does not work. All right, or as I say, you've got some kind of problems with storage, which is not uncommon. All right, and uh, occasionally blocks of IO just fail. But um, you can see messages too there, and here is a, such a message, All right? And um, this is the, the result of typing D message, you know, something like, uh, according to this, it's six, but I should imagine it's uh, something with a six in the end, seconds, and uh, it is actually uh, initializing that uh, device. And as we know, seen previously, we now know that it's all working. All right, so that's good. If it doesn't get this far, and you could take sometimes uh, if you've got some broken hardware, you can actually remove, or you've probably got a broken port even. All right, you can um, just literally remove that hardware and put it back in, or even put it into a different port. All right, and sometimes that will not just not uh, initialize, or at least um, say that it's there even. And uh, sometimes if you see, we'll see later on, you'll just see. Uh, USB uh, IDs and it'll say, I just don't know what this is. But uh, if you don't get that, that's a very bad sign. If you do get uh, IDs, it's a point to work from. And if you get as far as all this, then it's that's actually incorporated a lot of drivers. So that's good news. All right, and here's one, it was similar. <coughs> and this is off the, I think this is off my desktop. Uh, we're talking about now, probably just about when I threw some coffee at it, actually, right, which wasn't a good move. Well, when I found out, uh, I was trying to dry the coffee off. Right, so it was complaining that these devices were uh, somewhat broken, right, and support wasn't there. And uh, that's of interest if you want to find either devices are built in or otherwise on what they're failing for. Um, so. What other tools do we have? So um, going probably the most common ones, right, uh, is probably as most of our peripherals these days tend to be USB and uh, as such removable. Um, LS USB, so you list all USB devices, right? And um, <clears throat> that's rather handy. That's probably your first uh, call of attack for obviously for it. Uh, USB devices, new ones that you haven't got uh, drivers for. You're going to start looking here and uh, seeing what the reports are. All right, and uh, after going to D message and at least seeing that the um, device was actually found. And uh, let's go a little bit further on. All right, and this is a plain U LS USB. All right, and it lists out there. Basic information, most important information is the information here, which is the actual IDs. So uh, there's two hex numbers separated with a colon. Uh, I remember make sure that's right. That's the vendor ID and that's the product ID. So who made it and what it is. All right. So um, those two references, as long as you've got those, all right, you've probably got a good chance of actually finding out. Uh, what your device is even sometimes uh, if you, even if they probably marked up as the same device, you may well find that that's um, that is the reference. That's the important one. So if you have a, I don't know, two printers, it look exactly the same or and or that's probably less likely to um, I, two cameras two uh, two uh, sort of um, cameras for USB cameras, they might have the same model, they might have the same name, like the same plastic body, and you bought one, 
and uh, the support is great for one and not so great for the other and what you may well find here is that that may have the same vendor and the different product id but from there you can actually prove it all right so um that's important so here we go i've just taken this one out here let's go let me go back there you go i've emphasized this here so this is the uh the dongle again so presuming i didn't know what this dongle was i'd literally just cut and paste this or at least the vendor id and google is your friend all right and you'll see here that i don't need to go very far to actually work out that this um device is a real tech tv dongle dvbt which is the prevalent system in europe so uh, <clears throat> this is well supported and uh, to the extent i've just plugged it in and it is working so uh, there's really not much to be going on there but you can read your documentation then that's a way of basically diving in to the documentation pick up the ID or even the whole string, put it into Google, and then start reading the, uh, the documentation as is. Right, so this one is the uh, bit further down the line. So you wanted to see how these uh, devices are actually attached. All right, and um, you can start doing some diagnosis. All right, and um, which is a little bit more sophisticated. So you can see, you know, let's have a look here for you. So this is a port, this is probably a hub. And say if the root class is a hub. So someone has plugged this into a hub. I know that I've got one up the front here. So uh, that was the hub they used, All right? And then there was a set of ports in the hub. So that's particularly USB. And uh, we had a couple of, um, we had a keyboard, I believe that probably is, your HID device. Right, and then we have a couple of three uh, USB sound cards I was using for picking up some various audio. Right, and uh, here is the device that I was looking for, and that's the RTL dongle. Right, so um, let's see if we can find what it will also do. I'm not sure what that device is offhand. I think that might be a keyboard and a um, a keyboard and a little track mouse device tracker. So effectively, like a uh, keyboard for a uh, a um, USB equivalent to what's on a, normally on the front of a laptop. So uh, it's connected the same port, and um, it is has got two endpoints, right? As it turns out, they're both supported. One's the trackball, one's the keyboard, I think you'll find. All right. But what you will find is also it will enumerate and then like just list out these endpoints. So you could have one physical device. And as I say, an example would be a scanner and a printer. You quite get to often get those. And uh, you may well see the scanner as an endpoint, the printer as an endpoint and quite often a card reader or something like that as an endpoint as well and that would basically be three items on here and uh, the reason that is interesting is that um, you may well find it's partially supported so you may well find the printer maybe say the card reader supported and you have trouble with the scanner or some such so uh, at that point you can work out um, what you need to actually uh, to get finish your support if anything Right, or you can actually come out here and find out each item and uh, gives you some information to Google by. And uh, <clears throat> this is a very similar sort of situation. Right, and this is uh, go back a bit. And this is the verbose. So if it didn't get enough information previous to that, then uh, you can come over here. And this one is my uh, Sennheiser uh, link, that says here, it's a link device, right? And it tells us all sorts of information. <clears throat> um, some of it's more readable than others. And uh, some of this is really just purely and utterly uh, 
relevant to a machine. It's nothing to us, but uh, obviously there is some uh, human readable information. So the important thing here, it's taking that ID vendor, the USB ID and the ID product, and it's enumerated it into sort of uh, into into something humans can understand. So I know now it's Sennheiser, and I know it's my SP20. All right. <clears throat> and uh, it can also read the um, the string out of the uh, actual USB. I think this actually come from the USB device, in actual fact. And you can also see that there is two end points here. And um, the information, it's self-powered but it's also going to take 500 milliamps to actually charge. And um, little things like this, you, you might actually find, uh, say, if you've got a laptop, and um, laptops are notoriously bad or very good USBs, depending on uh, and how you um, wish to think about it, is that the power management for um, laptops tends to mean that um, it will implement quite strict implementations of USB protocol. So if this asked for 100 milliamps, which is I think is the actual default amount actually, not the 500. So initially it'll ask for, it'll give you 100 and you have to request the lot. So, uh, <clears throat> but most people just kind of assume you're gonna get that 500 milliamps at least. All right, you can take what you want. And that you can do that with a desktop. And um, so if you ever see any, weird behavior and someone says, oh, it worked okay on my desktop and you're plugging it into your laptop. You can probably look here and you can see that, um, yeah, that's gonna take my 500, full 500 milliamps and um, make my uh, make my laptop complain about, um, you know, the actual device is far too hungry and cut it off, All right? And um, also you get um, issues where the power management will not give this power where it's asleep. So um, if you have a USB device which wants to be awake at all times and never go to sleep, then that's another uh, issue that you you need to deal with. So you can actually just have things. Oh, it went weird when it went when I went to sleep, or you know you probably don't realise that. So it says, oh, it just started going weird, right? And uh, that is a uh, an actual that's the actual reason. Also here. I mean, we've got some interface classes. These are standard classes. And uh, as you see, this is audio. And uh, I've got no drivers in this. I think, and uh, can we scroll down? Oh, yes, we can. Oh. And um, this is, it's a, these are just generic drivers, but there is two of them. And um, one for the microphone, one for the uh, speaker. And I think there might actually be another one again for the, uh, which appears for the actual buttons on the device. Yeah. All right, and I think this is a simple, similar um, output for uh, the RTL dongle, All right? And uh, again, we can see that uh, it enumerates in uh, full on, English, generally just just well, whatever language the actual strings in, so uh, it just reports those strings, and it makes it easier, right, for people to go and uh, diagnose these. Again, these are the actual important bits. So you just literally cut and paste these or type them into Google and start finding some devices. And there is some, uh, there is a, uh, I'm not sure what the website's called at the moment, but uh, there is a USB um, ID database or list of data of devices and um, you can uh, find that that uh, your device in here or in there rather and, and uh, there is a there's a small rendition of that built into Linux for the pulling some of this stuff up uh, and again you see th important things like uh, maximum power 500 milliamps so you know it does actually declare what it is so you know if you've got a device which is portable and it's trying to go into power management, you can think, you know, well, maybe there's going to be uh, <clears throat> some actual problems here. And again, multiple interfaces. So there's actually multiple components that uh, are supported individually by the uh, by the driver. So you may well find that they're not just, they're not, they're not just one driver to support this, but uh, many. All right. But 
the thing to note is is that those in the in the meeting for example who already know this will feel quite comfortable about it but if you're coming in from a as a let's call them a linux newbie i don't like that word but uh it is the word people use then <clears throat> using these basic commands and they're very easy to, easy to execute just directly from the command line you can pull up lots and lots and lots of information all right some of which is very useful and uh you know, can actually help you on your search for what that device is, where it is, what the problems can be, and uh, where to find some help. <clears throat> so uh, I, I did was saying here that um, it is important. As I said, we bring it back here and we have a look at the uh, devices. These are unique, right, for these particular devices, and uh, they're baked into the chip. Right, and really, only one uh, manufacturer really uses that uh, that ID. But uh, certain chips, such as serial ports, parallel ports, um, certain bus drivers, right, uh, Atmel microchip, they uh, they all have their own ID. And um, if you are a manufacturer of a, probably a small run device then you don't want to go and pay thousands of dollars to join the USB club and um, <clears throat> that way get your own vendor ID, which you then program into your chip. So you might want to, you might get your, your interface chip is um, an FTDI, an Atmel, say a prolific, and there's a whole load of serial devices. And um, you will notice that um, it will be the generic ID for the manufacturer of the chip, not the manufacturer of the device or the device or the board using that chip. So, um, and that could just mean that um, could do anything. It could be a bit of a wild card. Generally, though, um, we're fortunate that uh, you get very basic uh, operation. So, you can imagine most of these are all just serial devices. So, although you don't know what um <clears throat> what serial information you need to send to them you do know that they are serial so you could probably here we go and this one uh, i think this one was uh, i think at the time was a radiation sensor which sounds very good but you can imagine the um the number of people are going to go out and buy a radiation sensor is minimal right and um that's just got a simple that this would be the um, I think this is the set of the same same as an Arduino if people know what those are. So this is actually like a an Atmel device uh, such as like an Arduino, which just as I say a USB to serial, and it knows what it is. It knows it's a serial port, but it doesn't know it's a radiation detector. All right, and um, I think we go back here. Near it is actually a Geiger counter. Very nice. Do you imagine there's probably this is this is uh, quite an unusual device, but uh, quite simple, right? And uh, there's probably thousands of devices like it uh, using that particular chip. And uh, you plug any one of those, they'll all enumerate as the same thing. So, is it a Geiger counter or is it a, you know a uh, a serial port, some kind of device like such as this? or uh, anything like that and you don't know um i think obviously if you saw you know if that was the size of a car you'd know it wasn't that geiger counter but uh you know you might need you're know, just using those ids isn't guaranteed it's just the start and uh <coughs> here i've just done the same thing i've put the uh usb ids so that's the vendor which is probably atmel and the device is probably some generic device number i really don't know what the number is and you see it's but it's this project id it's more to do with the project uh, than it is even to do with the hardware but um anything using that project that serial device driver has that uh, here we go probably is that a roomba i think is that the uh the um the hoover so yeah, the the vacuum cleaner so 
yeah, maybe your vacuum cleaner has the same IDs as uh, some serial devices or that radiation from device. So, uh, yeah, be careful. Don't just blindly go down the route, uh, route of thinking that that will just work for you straight out the tin. It's a uh, pretty good, but not perfect. In actual fact, I've just um, proved that this was this is from a the actual device and I went in there and uh, from there let's go back see if it actually mentioned it no but oh, it did say it was a serial adapter so uh, I was pretty certain but when a new serial port appeared but that was probably it and uh, this is minicom right and something came out of it and it's all obviously based in in this case English so uh, we can read it and it means something it's obviously badly formatted because it's not designed to be pumped through minicom but now I know what it is I can uh, support it with some custom code or some such I can actually just cut and paste this and send it to someone to get some help and uh, somewhat less useful these days uh, in as far as probably got a lot less uh, PCI hardware people put clutchily go in there and plug in unwittingly All right is the LSPCI and this was actually the first um, actual um, rendition LS USB came a bit later and uh, very similar formats so uh, let's list everything kitchen sink list in tree form so obviously you've got many buses uh, you might not be aware what bus the uh, the actual physical buses inside your um, your machine, but I think I've got at least two on here to, with two processors, and then dash V again, which is a verbose, which is going to be uh, give you all the details on the uh, actual device enumeration, etc. So uh, we just could probably quickly go through those again. <clears throat> Right, that's PCI, and I'm and I'm basic. I'm looking here. Let's find in all the internal devices, right, or rather the non-internal devices which weren't Intel, right? Because uh, the inter if you look up here, this is my all the internal devices, and if I was to do that now on the desktop, I'd probably end up with two or three screenfuls of uh, internal devices, which the uh, your South, North and South Bridge actually create. So all your peripherals that are on board, your actual, uh, <coughs> your actual machine are uh, individual. So although you might have two chips on there, right? You, it's not generally something like a North and South Bridge. You may quite literally have 50 or more sub devices inside there. Everything from serial ports, parallel ports, USB ports, Right, and um, memory controllers here. Uh, if you've got three or four memory controllers, you'll have three or four um, repeats of this. And these, these are there's not much you can do about these. If they don't work, then you, you know, you're, you're probably in a world of hurt, and you probably haven't got to this uh, point of actually working out um, whether hardware is compatible or not because you just can't get into the system at all if this didn't work. But um, a bit further down here. These are all the hardware that I've got, uh, bits of hardware that I've got um, plugged into the desktop, which are, um, in this case, all supported, right? And uh, then we got here, we got things like NVIDIA, more NVIDIA, right? A uh, sound card, a SATA controller to replace the one that now doesn't work because of the coffee, right? USB controller, because I want some USB 3 and it's quite an old motherboard and some 10 gigabit optical NICs. So there's some nice things. Uh, also, just as a little uh, thing, you've got the non volatile memory controller. So your, oops, uh, it's quite interesting to note that uh, if you've got NVMe, they're not actually plugged into, um, say, a SATA port for. Or, or even USB, what or, or any other sort of interface, they're actually plugged in as a PCI device. So um, what I call it NVMe, it's basic, basically a manner of getting PCI lanes into a uh, 
into your into your memory stick right and as such as fast as the pci lanes so many tens of megabits a second or megabytes a second even depending on the actual uh, controller which is obviously why it gets the speed it does right <clears throat> Oh, I'll say here that's the bus, and these are the um, device and um, sub device controllers. Just for a reference, let's go here for example. Um, this is obviously one card, right? This is the GTX 1050, which is on here, right? And the output is, uh, which is a normal conventional video output, is. Uh, here as one item and again still on the same card for example is the <coughs> actual hdmi audio output and uh, it's got another device and uh, so you can imagine yeah, you, know, you plug one device in here and you might get half a dozen actual um sub devices so if you start seeing things like that you, know, you see you see these are the same same here for example this is a dual controller so here's the first controller but obviously both the same right and here's its mate the second controller which is just the same thing but on the uh on the same board right but because there's two of them it, when it's been cycled through it's enumerated them as if they're two devices which basically they are to be honest but you can take all this information and here's a more in-depth one of, and it does look like Greek, I, I would agree, but you can see how these devices are broken down. Right. And it gives you in, some indication. I don't think this is particularly useful to be fair to you. But um it does give you an idea what's attached where and what and if you've got performance issues, for example, if you attach everything to the same bus, if you've got many sub buses then you might find that's a performance issue. So how you pick and mix those could be, this could be useful for that, but um, generally speaking, that might be more interesting. If you go into the verbose, you'll see somewhere around here. Let's find, yeah, so here's the devices, device names, device IDs and quite a long descriptive text of what these devices are. Oops. And uh, from there, you can copy this information in and uh, you can find what support you may have, need to compile in if that happens to be uh, required. So you, you see, you can get, you can end up with some quite um, weird and wonderful things. So this is a uh, Xeon chipset, and we're even in Numa. So uh, this will actually uh, could well be on one CPU, one CPU or the other. There's actually two CPUs, so uh, those buses are separate. And all this information you can start supplying to. Uh, to the community and uh, they may well be able to help you for just be using these. <clears throat> um, I think most people who are already uh, going a bit further, so going, it's UDEV, now this is a system um, which sits and on uh, listening to events, right, and uh, which is generally the events of plugging some hardware in which generally means USB hardware, as far as we're concerned. All right. And at that point, going through a set of instructions, uh, descriptions, all right, it will then know what to do with um, a particular device and automatically actually load the driver. So if your device has UDEV support, then you haven't even got to manually put that uh, driver in. And this is here, events relating to the connection and deconnection of hardware and identifying it from its ID. So these IDs, which uh, probably don't really mean a lot to uh, most people most of the time, are very useful to the machine. And um, these are 
also used within UDEV. And I think we've got, we've got a description here. So this is uh, this was my UDEV rules from uh, I think probably the same uh, machine, right? And if you look on your actual your machine, possibly now a bit later on, you'll see the same or very similar rules, <coughs> right? So um, for example, you know, we've got a Huawei network connector or a not uh, these are probably um, phones or um, 4G adapters in this case, right? Uh, we got some pulse audio devices. Let's find some um, more recognizable one. So these are virtual for probably for the QMU guest hardware. Uh, these have been put in here for the um, by the driver installer for the NVIDIA. So when it comes up, it actually knows what to uh, do with the NVIDIA device. All right, and let's even find the RTL dongle. Uh, so this is our U box. You can just see that. Oops, oops, by my fault. All right, so um, U blocks, I happen to know, is a uh, GPS device. So if you plug it up to a particular USB device in there, that USB um, GPS, it knows how to set that device up. I'm assuming that's the Spice device for um, at, for um, QMU, KVM. All right, and uh, it's one of the, and this is RTL dongle, which is the one we saw earlier. Right, and um, you can well, I don't know any is there. It's got to be like a hundred devices, and quite often you can have, you can add. They'll you'll see instructions. You've probably all seen those before. Like um, insert um, a U rule into your U Dev directory, and uh, this device will then be supported. And uh, once you've done that, um, you're generally good to go. Good uh, good documentation will probably almost give you that straight away and here's an example actually this is um <clears throat> this is for a radio of mine right uh, must have been on there at the time and um i went for the documentation uh pub actual fact I, i'm sure i googled it right and um here you go so it's a usb device the vendor id so this is this is basic instructions to um UDEV, which is sitting um, continuously running in the background. All right, so you know, listen to your subsystem. If this happens to be on the USB subsystem, you know, vendor ID, as we said before, 2500, product ID, number two, and yeah, group. I think that's probably just an, the uh, relating to this here. And um, it's going to install the right driver for the job. So there's instructions to do so, and you may well have to do that from a set of instructions given to you, either from uh, community resources or uh, from the actual product uh, manufacturer. So to be honest, let's go back here. That's probably about as complicated as it ever gets. You're not going to uh, create this yourself, probably, right? These are going to be supplied to you, and you I've just cut and paste these, or um, you might just have to type them in, but that would be the most complicated thing you'll do. And then once you've uh, saved these and put the hardware in, it'll receive the event and work out that from the ID vendor, product vendor, product ID, that the um, the actual uh, device has arrived and we'll sort it out for you. All right, so um, slightly awkward um, device to use. It's a, for example, uh, you're going to either support the hardware yourself, do the writing yourself, or more likely um, actually communicate with the community Right. Oh, this um, device does this, that, and the other. Right. Say, for example, um, this is predominantly ne network. This is designed for networks, but uh, USB devices as well. Right. Um, you will be asked to see what the strings that come out of it, how it communicates, and it will give 
because quite quite potentially the person trying to help you has never seen one of these devices and has never um seen your particular device or network or setup and uh you need to provide them some information right and um wireshark does this and i'm sure most people uh sysadmins have used this before generally speaking to uh listen to network data but right and if you've got a network device then obviously that's uh that's a given but uh if you've got a uh usb device it will listen to our endpoints and it'll also do this under windows as well so um this is a very good product to install and uh, actual fact um if anyone wants to do that i, I would recommend them I mean, it <clears throat> it will actually do a lot of decoding for you all right it's uh, probably best to look in at a uh, web-based uh, documentation on how to actually run this because it's uh, non-trivial all right and i certainly wouldn't go on about it here and uh, it's not scripting even inside the uh, tool that you can do all right and that's the place to get it from or from your local um actual repo so i know for the fact that ubuntu and fedora red hat etc will actually support this and uh once you've actually installed it right you will see something like this this is the first run i probably ran this as root actually because um i didn't set the group but um here we go so this is the normal network devices so that's what most people will be using it for we won't be interested in the uh <coughs> in the uh in the usb devices most of the time but uh we do have um usb support and we're looking here obviously we see it's actually listening to the data so you know this is quite a nice little addition for the newer versions right and um we know there's some data being picked up so we could probably have a look at it and uh, we normally sort of hit this big massive sh sharks uh, fin and uh, the right way it goes all right and uh, i think let's see what we've yeah, so if we go back here, this is the actual um, serial device. It was the Geiger counter, as I remember. All right, and um, you will see after you've done your capture. So, that's after, so you start it, stop it, and then it's displaying this here. All right, and um, it's we can obviously see it working. Uh, you can see what it's doing. All right, you can see what protocol, obviously the source and destination, and the actual data. And I think for 99% of us, it means absolutely nothing. It's quite a, uh, it's quite a terse device, but you can save this and send it to somebody. And if they're writing a driver, this will be gold to them. And uh, <coughs> we've let this run a bit further. And uh, this is probably the reason I chose that device because it actually outputs uh, human readable text, which we can see packaged in the uh, USB uh, frame. So if you come in here, this is all the listing of the frames. So this is the timing of the frames, the numbers of the frames, what the frame is about, as I said, and what bus it was on. Right. And uh, it knows how to inspect USB frames. You know, there's the information again up the top there in, in Precy. And uh, we want to have a look at the actual contents. So I've just basically clicked on there to expand it and it's come out here and it's got mostly information. I have no idea what it is, right? But uh, this bit here is obviously human readable. So that's uh, quite handy. And you can save these as uh, key caps as they're called and uh, you can actually just attach this to an email and send it to your uh, victim of choice who will hopefully help you out. Failing that, I will. Uh, saying that, you're going to have to do that yourself. So, um, in which case, you'll be telling everybody about how you use PCAP or your PCAP to actually analyze it. Um, yeah, this is this is one um, other point, and this is possibly a um, not always the way pe people would want to do this. But um, 
I always build these things somewhere else. So if you're actually trying to work out what the hardware is and what it does or what, and uh, what drivers you need, uh, both in user space and uh, in your kernels, you don't want to, ch to actually break the main system, right? Uh, then uh, it might be a very good idea of just spinning up a VM. I mean, it's all free now. I mean, most people are driving CPUs, which will support um, very good quality uh, VMs with um, hardware redirection, right? And that's uh, quite handy. So that's VXT for non and VXD. Someone could correct me if that's not not the correct uh, features. But most will support that, except for some laptop models. And um, what that will allow you to do is to uh, spin up, say, another, in this case, it was another Fedora, but it could be another Ubuntu or whatever else. It could be another Windows. You know, if that's what you want to do, that's uh, that's great. That's not a problem, All right? And the uh, the KVM will actually pass the hardware through, and it will look for all the world as if that uh, hardware is being plugged magically into that VM, and you can. Um, <coughs> Pardon, you can uh, support or work on the support inside the VM. And as it says here, you can snapshot. So if you grab up, you do your work, you can uh, get so far. If you want to abandon it, uh, you can just literally scrub that in whatever bad state it may be. It's not really a, it's non consequential. You can do all the VM goodness, you can clone it, you can snapshot it, you can wind it back. You can just rebuild it and it's of no consequence to your day-to-day uh, -day operations on your desktop. So uh, that's, to my mind, is by far the best way of doing it. And um, yeah, well, if it breaks, it breaks. But if it uh, if you broke your host, right, or, you know, you've got some inc desperate compatibility issue, you're not going to be very happy if that's, um, you know, your main machine. So I personally always do that. And also, as I say here, you can have a different, totally and utterly dist different distro. So you can have what you want, you know, your, possibly your desktop distro, or, you know, if you know that there is support. <coughs> so you could be in a situation where you might have many um, bits of hardware, you know, say, I don't know, maybe for Windows. So, you know, it works on Windows, right? Uh, and I was probably and uh, people say, oh, no, I don't like that. But if you want to prove it works and you just want to get it going, uh, it's, you could quite literally just abandon a lot of the uh, the complexity of the Linux um, diagnostics process. We just gone through there very quickly. Right. But uh, install Windows in a VM, pass the hardware through and say, or BSD, whatever you whatever you wish, or maybe, for example, some of the radio stuff works better in Ubuntu than uh, on Fedora because the software support is but more finished. I know the uh, some of the builds are broken on the Fedora one, so um, I, I might use Ubuntu there, and uh, I can use all the same diagnostic tools. Uh, say Windows also has the um, Wireshark as well, so you can actually uh, get it working under um, Windows. If you've got Windows drivers for your device, and it's Linux device drivers you're looking for. If you want to actually pass information to the um, to the actual, uh, well, back to the community or diagnostic information to whoever, to your vendor, right? You can actually get it working under Windows. Take a snapshot using Wireshark of the data being transferred. Right, and actually pass that on to uh, whoever, right, or work on it yourself to find out what data is being transferred. So you may well find it's quite understandable, and maybe you're able to actually write that yourself. But um, generally speaking, you're passing that to a specialist because um, it's certainly non-trivial, especially um, kernel drivers. Maybe not so much the uh, the user land support, but um, Certainly, kernel drivers is specialized, but uh, generally, good idea build it somewhere else, and that is why, and that's what I do. And uh, this um, talk is actually running inside the VM, so <clears throat> yeah, so uh, going a bit further in, let's be honest, it's the yeah, we all think of the hardware on there because the hardware talk, but uh, software is everything, so uh, you know, you, you can. Uh, 
you feel confident if you're the hardware's been proved working somewhere else, and then you can um, build actually inside that VM, right? And um, well, let's be honest. It's the you know this is where this is where the actual problems lie. You're going to have to start working here, so you can actually go and build that entire stack of software, right? And connect up bits and of uh, uh, typical Unix style bits of drivers communicating to a whole stack of software right um, to and tools to generate a uh, a piece of software but that is well, a piece of software a, uh, a system that is actually working and that's the other good thing about a VM is that you can keep it so um, pretty much pristine between versions. So if you want to upgrade your, uh, if you want to go an Ubuntu system and you say, I'm running a Fedora here and your VM and it's all working and you don't want to, <clears throat> there's no need to actually uh, update your uh, actual VM just because you're updating your host. Uh, it's a, it sort of compartmentalizes that problem, right? And you can work on that as you will, right? And uh, anything that is in there, uh, good or bad can be just stored, and you can actually have it packed almost like a uh, actual um, piece of software. So if I want to send this to somewhere else, who's also got a similar piece of hardware, I can uh, actually send a, a a KVM image or you know your VMware or whatever you're going to use. It doesn't really matter to be honest. You got you can send that piece of software um, date across as as a dot kvm or vmdk or whatever to ship it across and that's your pro that solves your problem it solves your problem it's quite expedient now apparently i'm going to uh do a demo so uh let's see what we got and uh it's only going to be a slightly uh disorganized one but um let's see what we can do uh, before we go anywhere, should we ask, see if there's any questions to be asked? I just sort of run through that quite quickly. So there's probably a, quite a few questions. Anybody? Uh, if you have questions uh, and you don't want to be on uh, the recording, please write it in chat and someone will read it up. But I only see one as I can put that in there. Uh, and you may just have misspoken. Uh, you said something about the UDEV set up uh, basically for your hardware to be used. I just want to point out that that can't happen until the, and you keep calling it a driver, uh, but that's fine. But I mean, it can't. I mean, happen. they like to call it a driver. It's more of a handler, isn't it? Or configuration. Yeah. Yeah. The kernel it's has to be handler. configured before you do works. But other than that, uh, that's the only. Yeah, it's more or less the last step. I mean, you may well have a driver in there and no UDEV rule, right? So it won't magically start the driver until you've. Um, yeah, well, as you well know, Peter, I don't know it's regardless of you, Jeff. those two are not related. Other than no, no. Jeff listens to whatever the, the drive when there was the driver initializes. Yes. Uh, yeah, so um, what we got here? Oh, dear. Well, as you can everyone, imagine. Uh, go off mute or, and speak or write questions in the chat. It's up to you. Anyone there? Not seeing anyone so far. Okay. Yeah, so um, what I've done here, this is actually a VM, this is a little Fedora VM, which I've, I've stored in the corner. All right, there's that Tony. Oh, there's, there's one now, sorry. Do you mind? There's a question from Tony saying, how do you know if a module has support for your hardware? Um. I think really the, the support for your hardware, it means it, it's actually identified your hardware. So when you do a, um, let's say an LSUSB, LSPCI or whatever, you will actually see um, the driver, let's see if I remember, the driver would be mentioned in there, right? The driver that's allocated to it, right? But there again, you could uh, have a situation, as you say, say if you've got a driver and you've got, because um, all based, uh, they, they don't magically identify your uh, devices, so it's based on that um, 
vid and uh, pid as they call them vendor and, pro uh, and uh, product id and um, if you had two devices were literally exactly the same and one had the pid that was expected and the other one had something else in there whatever it would be all right then um, the one that was correctly identified would work the one which um, one which didn't have the correct ID wouldn't work. So you can have, and also you can have the converse one where the uh, devices uh, will pretend to be the same, but the support, uh, the actual internal device has changed, right? Someone's used cheaper components, different components, almost changed totally and they didn't want to re-register it so it's just registered with the same id and that device really really is not supported by that driver so um normally it's automatical due to those those ids the um if you want to be then if you want to force it you can generally force them by asking it to uh, to uh, drop map to that driver um normally you wouldn't just randomly do that because more likely or not that's just going to crash the machine straight out um you'd probably be looking again as i say using that information and uh, going onto the web to pick up that um pick up uh, the information to find out if that driver does support it right or the, there is actually better drivers you might actually be blacklisting the driver that um will <coughs> automatically uh, try and support that device in preference for a uh, a better driver. So um, yeah, no magic involved. It's all based on that ID, generally speaking. Does that answer well, yeah, the question? I think you might want to turn that around a little bit. And maybe the question was more: if I have a, I if I see something, let's say on a PCI bus, how do I know what driver to put? I think maybe that's what's being asked. Yeah, I think we'll probably have a look at that in a bit if I can remember. Okay, thanks. Okay, yeah. So um, let's see what we got here. Do, 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 do. I mean, for example, here, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, the registered new interface driver DVB, DVB USB device. Yeah. And uh, I, I know for full well that it's actually started that driver because this is in D message. So if I literally, uh, plug and unplug these devices they will appear there as they're unplugged and this would be as a result of uh udev to make sure right right you're actually finding these devices i've been actually picking up the event and then uh starting off the initialization process um i think also let's actually do the d message so this is of a virtual device a virtual a um, VM, right? And uh, um, we've all seen these before, Peter. It's out, but uh, as you can see, this only took about three or four seconds to start up. And uh, in reality, there's very little uh, hardware. Hardware is obviously nothing physically attached to a virtual device, but um, there are virtual devices which don't legitimately exist over and above the uh, ones we've actually handed over to it and as you can see there's a lot of um <clears throat> lot of information in there all right so uh, you probably want to use grep to find strings that you're looking for you know say here or look at the end of the device because it's probably where you know as you can see it started in a few seconds and it was about an hour or more later when the scanner appeared and or half an hour and a full hour later and early when I put the other device in. So um, you'd be looking in there to uh, just get some initial sort of information. Um, let's think of some way we could have a little trot out. So, And this was the initial commands we were having a look at here all right and uh we have got we got some hubs which uh would effectively simulate 
USB hubs in real life, but uh, they are the uh, virtual devices. They don't really map to anything. Right, and uh, I don't know where I've got my tablet from. It's got a tablet in there. I'm not quite sure where it's picked that up from. Right, but um, it's got the real tech uh, TV device and the scanner. Right, I want to find something else a bit further down there. And this will be fairly interesting. So I would imagine that tablet is the keyboard. So anyway, or virtual or otherwise. And uh, you could see what devices they're connected to. And this would be more useful if it was a real device, right, on a real, um, <clears throat> on a real USB. So uh, it's got USB 3. So if you imagine you're, you're putting devices into here and you suddenly think they're going at uh, full speed, and you put them into here, and then you're going obviously as fast as the bus will go. So you'll find limitations there. So that's something to note. Uh, here we've got the drivers. So this is the driver for the hub. This is, I'm not sure what that one is, but uh, to say it's a head device. So I'm not sure what that one was, right? And uh, this is the device. This is when they say, I think this is the question you're asking, um, Peter. You know, how do you find that information? So I've just done a tree view. Right. That, that shows you it's... what the kernel already knows. What if you don't know? You have a device you plugged in, and it doesn't show up at a driver because it's not known. Well, that's the next one here, for example, that 480 megabits. I think you'll find that that is actually the, um, the scanner I've put in, right? right. And th there is no driver because there is no support for it. So if you, if you, if you want to find out if that dis at this low level whether there was, uh, whether your problem is, say, uh, you're just not finding the, the raw device, yeah? Or you, it's a, it's a uh, user land problem. Or it's a driver problem. So if this was, uh, this is running. So I know that uh, unless this is broken in some manner, right? It's not the kernel drivers, right? It's more to do with the software, yeah, in uh, user land. Whereas here there is no driver, right? So quite obviously, you know, I could have the best user land software out it's not going to touch it because the driver doesn't exist i mean that's where you uh, were you, where you're alluding to yeah peter well it, it's sort of i'm just trying to interpret or tony's question he just walked back all good you got it oh good 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 yeah so i mean that's just the uh basic and uh, we could do that we're going back to you know, vv wasn't it so i think yeah and this is quite hateful. A lot of these things aren't designed to be even remotely friendly, right? Because they're not. This is information that uh, us as normal users, we're not interested in any of this, right? And if we're doing this, we are doing it as a diagnostic process, right? So, uh, yeah, little things here, right? Uh, so these are vendors. So these are, as I say, the vendor ID. It's a Linux device, right? From Mr. from Linux land, it doesn't really exist, right? And uh, you'll find the, that's the manufacturer string, right? And none of this information really matters, right? Maximum power. Funnily enough, it doesn't take any power because it's, it's virtual. Right, but um, it's fairly easy. Let's find another one. Nope. I think most of these are virtual, so I will. Uh, see if we can find something of interest. There we go.
trying to think where the driver is on here, but um, basic information, power, vendors, serial numbers, if you've got multiple of them. Right, I think, um, trying to think where the driver is on here. I remember myself. I think you'll find that it's actually a part of the. Uh, in, I'll have to look on that. But uh, yeah, this is unsupported. There is no driver for that, although it's managed to pull back most of the information related to it. And these obviously endpoints for things that. I'm not sure what that tablet is, but uh, it's probably a keyboard I've exposed at some point. Um, if we go down there and go into um, very similar sort of operations. And this is the virtual, these are all virtual devices. And as such, they probably just relate to um, A magic virtual machine, which is probably just enough for uh, Windows or uh, Linux to run. And um, you can actually see here we've got some Vertio drivers from Red Hat or devices from Red Hat. And uh, these are actual uh, Intel devices, so uh, which are just basically a PC. This is enough to form a PC, but they're not real. All right, as you can see there from Red Hat Inc. All right, let's see what device drivers they may have on there. It's the bus numbering, which is actually a bit simpler. An actual fact here is an example we've got here from in the verbose description. So this is a uh, this is a random number generator. But I mean, let's not to get too excited about it, but uh, it doesn't matter. But uh, it's sitting on a virtual bus. So it's effectively like a card plugged into your computer, except uh, it's effectively built in hardware. And not only is it built in hardware, it's virtual built in hardware it doesn't really exist. It still has a driver. And in this case, it, Vertio PCI, right? And uh, I suppose I imagine they were all actually created, and uh, you, know, you can see here they're all supported by the same device. So one master device that supports everything. <clears throat> I might take a risk and uh, run Wireshark. I might have to need to do that, and I'll do that as a route. So this is developed as a uh, network product, but and here's a one network device. This is any, this is a virtual device. This is the loopback network. I'm not sure about whether Bluetooth's relevant, not even remotely relevant, but we have some USB devices here and we see that there is actually some data coming from them. <coughs> what I'll do now is I'll say I want to move monitor that so that's maybe the not terribly informative to be fair to you right from this point of view right but it does give you enough information to start so let's just stop that and uh, let's have a just this is a random prod and uh, see if we can actually find anything of interest so let's human on us just open that up. Yeah, nothing particularly there. I mean, we could be talking, probably talking to a uh, non-human readable device, but it doesn't really matter. The point is, is the fact that you can actually do that. And uh, this file can be sent to whoever. Let's make that a little bit bigger. 
And one good thing about this is if this was our, uh, a Windows only driver and we were in Windows and we were running uh, this application Wireshark on under Windows, um, you could effectively sniff an entire working um, sequence. So if you say for the scanner, you had the scanner software and then you'd be scanning a page and you'd have lots of data, right? And you could send that, <coughs> analyze it yourself if you're of a mind or uh, send that to someone and uh, saying this is how it really does work, right? And uh, it can form a part of the uh, diagnostic process if no one else is supporting it or there was no Windows driver. There we go, stop there. If I want to save that, for example, you know, save as, right, and it's going to be PNG, uh, my device. And you save that, and then you'd obviously just attach it, send it, and away you would go. Um, let's pick another device. Something else for you of, of note. Pick another device. Probably this would be more conventional usage on as a network device. And we should probably see how uh, we've seen some routing information. So this VM is picking some routing information, so it's not uh, terribly interesting. Not terribly interesting, but certainly uh, shows that the device works quite well. And if I pick another. USB device sent to me. I might be able to find one that's readable. And it's quite chatty. So it's talking to whatever device driver is actually uh, talking to it. And let's continue to do so. On and on and on. I've had quite enough here, but you can see the gems. That's the packet number. That's the time it did it from your T0 when you started. Source device. So this gives you the direction of travel. All right. So obviously from the host to the device, and we obviously know that's port USB protocol. That's fairly uh, fairly obvious. And it just seems to be quite chatty, but quite sh just probably just identifying itself and probably some status information in there, not much. And uh, you can. The only issue is that these are I mean, probably not for entertainment purposes. All right, so unless you've actually got a device on here, actually, uh, as we used in the demo. So in the demo in the actual uh, PowerPoint, you, the actual um, device is sending ASCII text, which is readable. Then it, you can see that coming through. But otherwise, you're just going to say, this is what the machines see. And uh, as you can say, I'll just save that as my other device. You would send that, and so on and so forth. It's not a, um, it's not an easy task. It's probably not really a task. You know, something we can demonstrate very easily here, unless we specifically put some um, hardware on there um, for entertainment purposes. But it does show that the process 
it's fairly easy, you know, start it up. Pick another one. Start. And we get more of the same. And these devices are working or at least producing some data because the driver's talking to them. And that's another reason to use a uh, VM because obviously say you can set that all up. And uh, if it only works in certain OSs, certain versions of OS, and then you can get it going and uh, get some samples. So you can actually send that to the vendor or, or not some or the actual developers. So that's the uh, the important thing. Right, I think that's pretty much uh, where we are with that, uh, Peter. So I will take some more questions if you like. All right, I think the um, Wireshark might actually be an interesting thing for many uh, people. Okay, so to repeat myself again, uh, if you do not want to be recording your question, uh, just wait a moment uh, and we will uh, turn that off. But for now, just while we are wrapping this one up, uh, either go off mute and ask or put that in the chat. So, John, I know you work a lot with hardware, so I'm assuming a lot of your expertise and, and experience around this is based on the hardware use that you're doing outside of the, your standard workshop, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, for the most point, uh, my, the, the hardware I'm be using, if I'm on a, on a probably a professional basis, would be um, well, pretty well tramped out. It's you know the support is already there. All right. I think we could probably say take a uh, take Red Hat, throw it at it, and it works. Yeah, they're all <clears throat> people avoid this like the plague. All right, they they go for pretty much guaranteed working solutions. All right, um, it's only when you're trying to support something that um, is out of the mainstream or not your your, your usual drive support, then uh, or you're trying to enhance it in some way yeah. with some new hardware. All right, then uh, you'll be doing this. All right, and. Um, um, did you? For example, as I say, your Canonical might ask for this. They might not have a version of your hardware, and they might want to support it. Or more likely, someone is interested. I don't say video cards, or uh, someone's interested in writing a driver for your scanner, right? Then uh, they 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 might want to see how it works, but they don't necessarily want to go and pay thousands of pounds to buy one. <coughs> so. Uh, it's all it's all basic information, right? Supply if you can supply that straight out of the gate, right? right? And do that basic diagnosis yourself, right? Then um, you're more likely to get a uh, reply that is constructive, right? Um, and we, obviously we know, none of us like those um, just read the manual replies many people give out. Um, and you can actually engage with um, very technical peers and uh, provide them something useful that's going to help you. You know, you're helping them to help you. And I think that is the point. I, you know, help yourself. All right. So, first of all, buy good hardware. All right. Something that's well supported. Um, do your investigation, do due diligence on there. And that will get you most of the way there. And um, I think I, I think we have less and less of these issues, right? And the hardware it does have problems are probably more and more sophisticated, mm -hmm. right? And um, those other ones, there's those sort of 10, 20 percent tight items. I mean, quite often you know, we we we'll have probably got hardware it doesn't work on Windows now. You know, say Windows, you might have say a Windows 7 device, and then you've got a Windows 10 software and soon to be a Windows 11, right? So a lot of that software won't work. All right, so you're um, you're now in the process of uh, moving that across or um, gaining support from uh, well, from this going to be community support at that point. So uh, you know, if you're talking to a developer, I'm someone we all talk to developers, and they tend to be very busy regardless. All right, and um, even if they're most enthusiastic. Right, as most, uh, as I say, for working in open source, tend to be enthusiastic, but they, you know, they can't work miracles. They need that information. 
right and uh maybe they can do something for you so you follow those kind of basic tools yeah. Yeah, it's been my experience that you know, we can help help the developer or the community. They get and they get stuff back that works. Uh, so I've seen that many many times. Is the fact that you even if it's not hardware related, if you can go in and say, hey, I'm doing some testing or so some running of your software tool, and I have these weird graphics cards that work, but you you know I'm having some issues with your software. And they've never heard of it before. And they're so happy that you can just point out that, hey, this is my experience and you can actually help fixing it. And often you will see a fix very quickly. Uh, but there is a point I wanna make, uh, I, I'm fairly sure you've seen it too, John. Um, so I, when I started uh, doing Arduinos in, in, uh, and stuff like that, I mean, it, it, I was reading the instructions of how to install things on your computer. Mm. And I was so freaking happy I was not on Windows because that was a nightmare for most people to get it up and running. Whereas in Linux, it just worked. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think also the thing is that to note is that when in older versions of Windows, right, things were simpler, right? And then you, you've got a situation and, and they were software worked. All right, and you had drivers say on an XP or even Windows 98. Oh, you got these very simple drivers on simple interfaces on simple computers, and uh, security was not really a, a word they used. All right, and now sort of 10, 20 years later, all right, they've 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 taken that security sort of um, mantra. They've taken a lot of it on board. All right, so a lot of the features which made Say Linux or Unix difficult, right? So obviously now we've got a situation where we probably almost had always had that kind of security aspect in there, right? But then in the Unix world, but there's always that kind of uh, yeah, the the drivers weren't there. They were um, yeah, they were immature, and it was always the Windows stuff, and it was like uh, that was easy to make work. As they moved on, say from XP to Windows 7, 8, 10, or whatever, right? You notice that the, the security had changed, the mechanisms had changed, and um, things just wouldn't work. Maybe the driver would work, right? If there wasn't these fundamental security hurdles, which that Windows driver never had. So all of a sudden, previously, so now it's got them, it doesn't know what to do, right? and um you're you're basically just thrown into the mire because you just don't have the kind of community support for devices under windows that you do under linux yep. any other questions so that's what i'm looking for if not then uh well before we, we end the recording i want to thank you john for doing this uh, as you know no problem always are a tough cookie to get people to actually do talks and if john's talk inspired you to maybe talk about what you're doing or stuff that you feel that hey you would like to share or maybe it's just interesting um, check the lesson from john here and let us know and we will put you on the schedule for next year right now there is no planned talks for 2022 at all so you pretty much have your pick of when you can do it um, would be. Uh, I think we had a question from Lana. I think I just see it. Yes. Uh, do you want me to read it for you, John? Or I, I can't get the. Um, okay. Oh, can I get the chat up? Okay. So he says, is it recommended for Windows 10 users to not update to Windows 11? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't use it. But, well, it's it's obviously up to them and what's appropriate. But um, I think. If you if you update now, then you're effectively an early adopter or that way on. And if you've got older hardware, which is I presume working now, then maybe it won't be working when you've finished. So it depends what you got. I think, and also in that case, I think there's older older PCs in general aren't necessarily compatible with 11. So. Um, yeah, I think upgrading in general doesn't really matter what OS it is. It's got to be a bit more considered than uh, maybe uh, people are told you, uh, you know, in the general. Pub, oh yeah, you just put that on there, be all working, and it's auto magic. Uh, it's great when it works, right? 
but when it doesn't work then uh rolling back isn't necessarily as easy it could be and you're into a world of hurt so uh yeah wait for someone else to do it if you've got something specific on there if you've got the latest and greatest hardware you know computer wise and it's all well supported then it won't matter if you've got something that's a bit more historical or you know esoteric or if it breaks you're gonna have to fix it yourself because you know there isn't any support then uh, i'd wait for someone else to do it i think that's probably an answer oh yeah yeah but i think the drive sorry uh, that's from gustav yeah right gustavo yeah i think the um the driver works and i think actually the driver is improved right and it also opens a framework for other um camera devices and and to be fair i've always hated with a passion that um sort of raspy still and raspy that it was very bodgy but the thing is it's been uh, around for such a long time but it's actually a um it's now the it's now the uh it's now the way of doing things it's entered the community um sort of uh psyche so now that that is now being changed to be something that's a bit more generic then um yeah that's uh you know that's probably uh yeah i prefer the idea yeah well, i'd rather it being generic and uh, more like conventional windows so windows linux well, I mean, yeah, supported you know the actual stack is normal but as it was it wasn't normal before but it it is what most people have got used to and what a lot of the demos and whatever work with so yeah massive lack of support now and probably will be for some months and it'll, and it'll probably confuse a lot of people for almost forever right i don't know you probably could do a this raspy wrapper around it so it kind of did the same thing i can't see why you couldn't do that maybe someone did it i don't will do it. <coughs> yeah a lot of the drivers under rasp and raspian or are actually just big blobs right so yeah uh so i think right now there's like one a couple more questions i think coming in but i will stop the recording so those yep. who does not want to be on the recording can, can stay and ask questions uh and all that stuff so give me a second <coughs> 